Okay, so uh, this is the follow-up video to the Aufbau principle video. You should watch that one first, and this will make a lot more sense. Um, you should also maybe have a periodic table and a copy of your textbook handy, although that's not essential. Okay, so the point of this video is to help you continue building your understanding of the structure of the periodic table. I've said a few times now that as your understanding of electron configurations uh, evolves, this should make more and more sense to you and seem less like sort of an arbitrary uh, arrangement of the elements. Um, and so in order to get started with that, we are going to first strip away all the information except for the structure and focus on what that means. Um, you may recall that in class I said these first two columns of the periodic table are called the S block. And that means that according to the Aufbau principle, the last electron that we would add for each of those elements goes into an S orbital. If we're here in the second row, it's going into a 2S orbital. If we're in the fifth row, it's going into a 5S orbital, and so on. Um, in the second row, once we filled up these 2s electrons, we would then move into the p block. So that's this pink area here. And so the s block and the p block together, you may recall, are what make up the main group elements. Okay, so the p block elements continue. You have space for six electrons. These are the six that we've been filling into our orbital block diagrams. And by the time we get to the end of that, we are filling up uh, the column 18, which is a noble gas configuration. We'll have something more to say about that uh, in just a minute. Uh, for completeness, we should mention that there's also the D block. That's the transition metals here. And so when you are filling electrons into those, you're adding your last electron into a D orbital, and we'll do a separate video explaining how to do that. The F block elements, the actinides and lanthanides, um, are something you should know exist, but we're not going to worry about writing electron configurations for those. The only thing you'll need to do with F electrons is remember that when we filled them up, um, you need to add them to the uh, electron configuration. We'll see a couple examples of that in a future video. Okay, so let's go on with the importance of the noble gas configurations. So, when you finish filling up the P block in any row, you've basically added the last electron to that shell. So when we get to helium, there's no more room in the N equals 1 orbitals, and so that means we need to drop down to N equals 2. We need to increase the principal quantum number. And then we add to the 2S and the 2P, and now we have no more space in the N equals 2, so we need to drop down to the N equals 3, and so on. So the Noble gases represent the last electron into a given shell. This makes them exceptionally stable. That um, configuration doesn't want to be broken. They're chemically inactive. They don't want to share their electrons. They're hard to ionize. They don't want to add or give away electrons. So that noble gas configuration is, in a way, special, and it's going to form the basis for um, the rest of uh, this video. So you may also recall that uh, in the nearest noble gas rule was what we used for uh, determining the charges on ions of main group elements. Aluminum, which is in group 13, loses three electrons so that it gets to the same number of electrons as neon. And now we can appreciate why that might be so. By losing those three electrons, it attains the same electron configuration as neon, and so gets that additional stability of the uh, noble gas configuration. Oxygen can add two electrons and get to neon. So again, it's not the same as neon because it has two fewer protons and those electrons aren't as tightly held, but there is some benefit to having that noble gas configuration and so on and so forth. So that's the reason behind the nearest noble gas rule for charges on ions. Okay. And that's just a restatement of the rule. They lose or gain electrons to achieve the same configuration as the nearest noble gas. Okay. So now let's get on to the new stuff. First, what I would like you to do is draw the orbital block diagram or fill in the orbital block diagram for oxygen. So pause the video and do that now. 
OK. So um, you've had some practice doing this in your group activity, and uh, we've gone over it at least once in class. So you should have drawn something like that. OK, so uh, you've got 1s, two electrons in the 1s. This is the alphabet idea, two electrons in the 2s orbital, and then one, two, three, four electrons in the 2p orbital, where the fourth electron has to be paired because there's no more room for adding spin up electrons, according to Hund's rule. OK, so the new twist that we're going to put on this is we are now going to notice that the 1s2 part of this has exactly the same orbital configuration as helium and so that part of it is going to be very stable and in fact we make it a distinction we call that the core of the electron configuration and those core electrons are so stable that they are not going to be available for chemistry the electrons that are available for chemistry are called the valence electrons. So that's the 2s and 2p in the case of oxygen. These are those um, the electrons that are going to form bonds. They're going to, uh, you know, you can add electrons to get to the, the noble gas configuration when you're making oxygen and ion, making it the oxide ion, and so on and so forth. So uh, you'll see as we move on through this chapter and the next that we'll talk about oxygen as having six valence electrons. That's these electrons. We ignore the core electrons when we're talking about chemistry because they're simply too stable. So we can encode this in the notation that we use and we can write that oxygen has the configuration of a helium, that's the 1s2 part, along with the 2s electrons and the 2p electrons in its valence shell. And we can write that as an orbital block diagram, or you can write it as the normal uh, electron configuration notation as follows. Okay, so if this is making sense to you, you should be able to repeat this process, but now for sulfur. So pause the video and give that a try. Okay. You know, first thing you should have noticed is that sulfur is right beneath oxygen, okay? And so that means that we're expecting it to have the same valence configuration of two electrons in an s orbital and four electrons in a p orbital. It's just that the identity of that orbitals, those orbitals have changed. We start now, instead of with helium, we have neon as our nearest noble gas. So that starts off our configuration. And that's basically the 1s2, 2s2, 2p6 part of the configuration. And the rest of it is just the valence electrons. Like we said, there's two in the 3s orbital and four in the 3p orbital. The fact that sulfur has the same valence configuration as oxygen <coughs> means that it is going to have very similar chemical properties as oxygen does. And so that, um, basic, that basis was how Mendeleev was able to construct the modern periodic table without knowing anything about quantum mechanics. He was able to look at the reactivities and they were similar because when you have similar valence configurations or when you have the same valence configurations, the chemistry is similar. And so if we're going to write that in this notation here, that would be neon 3s2, 3p4. Okay, one more example. I want you to do the same thing for germanium, which is GE. It's right here. So you should be able to write <coughs> the uh, orbital block diagram and the electron configuration in this notation for uh, germanium. And see if you can't figure out when it comes time to write the configuration. See if you can't figure out what to do about the D electrons, although that's not the most important part. Okay, hopefully you're able to figure that out. Germanium is in the fourth row, which means the nearest noble gas is argon, so that's going to start off our configuration. And then there are 4s2, 4p2, it's in group 14 here, um, is the configuration of the valence electrons. Okay, and when you write it 
in the notation it's 4s2 and then we just count up all of these d electrons this is the 3d10 4p2 so that's kind of a preview of what's going to we're going to cover in the next lecture it's not so important if you didn't understand that right now but we do need to account for the fact that it has those d electrons and all of the d orbitals are filled by the time we get to germanium so we just write 3d10 right because the d block has 10 spaces in it okay that's the end of this video 